Welcome back to our walk in Christ and our study through the book of Amos. And today we're going to be looking at the rest of Amos chapter 5, verses 14 through 27. Now, this is the third message in the book of Amos. If you missed the first two, you can go and seek that. The overall arching uh, theme here of Amos chapter 5 is return to the Lord and live. He's talking about that, that God does not want to destroy the people, but if they do not do the righteous things, he will have no choice but to destroy the people. And then we talked about a few different seekings. There's three seekings mentioned. The v first video looked at the seeking God where he is to be found inside of true churches, inside of true places. This is where we are supposed to find God. And so with that, um, the second one was seeking true justice. Of course, seeking to find find the balance of what is right in our society in accordance with God's law. And then, of course, the last thing that we want to look at is uh, having a look at uh, today, seeking righteousness. And as we seek righteousness, this is really to do good according to God's word. And I got news for you. This is the one that causes more Christians to stumble. Because, and what I've seen just in the analytics of selling books, I do my Kings of All Creation series, and everybody is interested in prayer. So my best-selling book is Hezekiah's Prayer, hands down. Uh, I have, I don't, I, I mean, I, I have the numbers. I don't look at them uh, in case I need to. I, it is not an exaggeration to suggest I probably sold a few hundred copies of that book, which to be a small independent creator not tied to any church is an amazing and phenomenal thing. So uh, with that, though, the um, uh, just looking at it, Everyone's interested in the prayer. But the first book in that series, which I think is a much better book, is Josiah's Sanctification. Because this is really that first step. Before God will hear your prayers, you must be in his will. He is not going to honor the prayer in your life if you are harboring sin in your heart. And the process by which we become more and more like Christ is the process of sanctification, which at its fundamental level is attached to seeking righteousness. And so that is definitely something that we want to consider. In fact, we are highlighting that book here for this particular video. You can find it at the website rwalkingchrist.com slash books slash Josiah dash s dash sanctification. Maybe I should clean up that URL a little bit, but just head on over there, click on the books tab, and you will find Josiah's sanctification. Little 100-page book. It's uh, $6 on retail. You can probably find it a little bit cheaper. You can buy it anywhere. You can buy books online. And we do have an e-book e and an audiobook and a soft cover options as well. So here is a little bit about the book. You can see the uh, the period of, of how it's done. You can read the introduction over there on the website and see all of the scripture that we have referenced. So have a look at Josiah's sanctification as we consider to seek righteousness. So with that, let's go ahead and get on into our discussion here. And uh, what we want to do here is we will start in by looking at this last final seeking. So Amos chapter 5 verses 14 and 15. Seek good and not evil that you may live. And thus may the Lord God of hosts be with you just as you have said, hate evil, love good, and establish justice in the gate. Perhaps the Lord God of hosts may be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. So here we have references to do good, to not do evil. And then, of course, we have the call here to, um, we have this looking at the remnant, specifically mentions here the remnant of Joseph. All right. Um, which is, I think that is significant. If I'm remembering correctly, I'm trying to remember if uh, Judah and contain the line of Joseph or not. Uh, part of it did with Manasseh, and I don't remember where Ephraim is. I should probably know that, but for whatever reason, I don't. Consult some maps to see which ones are in the southern kingdom. I know at least half of Manasseh, if not all of it, are there. So the third seeking is to seek 
righteousness, which is to hate the things that are evil and love the things that are of God. That is really one of those early marks of a Christian that you you are bothered when you see evil and you love to see the things of God. Because when you love the things of God and you hate the things that are evil, justice itself is at the core of your heart and your manifestation of your life ends up being righteousness. So uh, Romans uh, gives us a warning. So Paul writes to the Romans near the end of the book, Romans 16, verses 17 through 19. Now I urge you, brethren, keep and uh, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you have learned and turn away from them. For such men are slaves, not of our Lord Christ, but of their own appetites and by their own smooth and flattering speech. They deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting for the report of your obedience has reached to all. Therefore, I am rejoicing over you, but I want you to be wise in what is good and innocent in what is is evil. And so we have to seek that as our life to to be wise in the things of good and to be innocent or some translations say ignorant in the things of evil. Both of them are a good translation. So, you know, we don't want to or necessarily we probably should not be perpetually attached to whatever the latest and greatest sins are. It's probably not beneficial to us to be all hip on the media culture going around. Although it is good that there are some people in the church that do that for the purpose of documenting and informing the rest of us as to what is there. So it's like that idea. Um, I, I mentioned this, I think in Joe Ash's influences, I mentioned it somewhere in one of my books. I knew a guy that believed he had to take every single drug because to not do a certain drug, you know, if you couldn't, if you didn't take them, you couldn't possibly know what was, you know, why you shouldn't. This is complete idiocracy. It is stupid. It is completely stupid to sit here and be like, I can't tell you how bad cocaine is until I've went ahead and run a line. Um, I don't really have to do that. I can actually learn from the mistakes of others. Um, I've not seen a lot of positive coming out of that lifestyle. Uh, so it is better to be innocent in what is evil. But I do like the fact that some people are at least have a greater pulse on those things and are credible and can inform us so we can learn. Not that everything we should learn should always be from a third party, but there are certainly times and places when it should. Now, in light of this, God promises to be with those who follow him. Okay, I will point you once again to Deuteronomy chapter 28. We are not going to read it here, obviously. First 14 verses of that is just a whole lot of blessings if you do what is right before God and a whole lot of cursings if you do what is wrong before God. Okay, and uh, we have to recognize that we have to, as I mentioned at the beginning, if we are if we are harboring sin in our heart, the Lord does not hear our prayers. And so as we're seeking, and, and I think that a lot of the reason people seek books on prayer is they want to know how to have a better prayer life. Well, the first way to have a better prayer life is to stop sinning. So you need to seek your sanctification first. Psalm 66, 18, to bring the biblical receipts. If I regard wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Now, uh, we also have another verse from Romans 8, 28. We know that God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Okay, so he works all things out for the good of those who love him. He promises to be with those who follow him. So if we are doing good, we are seeking God, we are in his will, we are those people that God has chosen even if we go through some difficulties and some challenges, nevertheless, we are going to see an ultimate good from that. Sometimes that ultimate good comes this side of heaven. Sometimes it only comes on the next side of heaven. We are getting our cultures becoming more and more hostile to us as believers. So we have to be prepared for the possibility that we are not going to have our best life now uh, in this side of heaven if we are standing firm on the word of God. Because as Jesus said, Said many times that if they loved me, they would love you, but they hate me, so they hate you. Uh, speaking of what God hates, God hates sin, and he calls us to do the same. 
Okay, our sanctification causes us to grow in our hatred for sin as we instead grow more and more like Christ. Again, Paul writes in Romans 12, 9, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. And so uh, in this verse, he is reminding us that God does not like sin. Psalm 97, 10, Hate evil, you who love the Lord, who preserves the souls of his godly ones. He delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Yes, God does indeed tell us to hate some things. Evil would be among them. Now, what does it take to become sanctified, thus start to seek righteousness? It takes a little bit of work on our behalf. Now, this is not works-based salvation, okay? This is sanctification. There are multiple elements. The entire umbrella of salvation carries with it several different finite points. The actual principal point of salvation would be justification. The point in time we are declared righteous despite our sin because of the propitiation of Christ covering us. This occurs at a single point in time when God chooses us, transforms our heart, and we now seek to love Christ. That is a point in time that happens. But to all, as the scripture says, to all I have called, I will glorify this glorification process starts here on earth. It's never completed here on earth, but it starts here on earth as we become more and more and more like Christ, as we delve deeper and deeper into the Word of God, as we consider the, the stranger things of Scripture, as we put together our ideas and we understand what God is, and we let the Holy Spirit teach us through the work of reading the Word and practicing these things and seeking God to overcome our sin. But there is an element of work. It is not the thing that causes us to be saved, but it is the thing that renders us saved. Uh, it renders us saved isn't the right word. Um, it is the thing that we must do this stage. It is basically the, the mark that we truly are believers. Okay, A person who professes to come to Christ and never changes and con continues to live his life in sin, he is not a saved person. Stop deluding yourself. The prayer that you made as a third grader does, is not relevant to those who do not persevere in the faith. Okay, that's not where I'm going in my notes. Uh, trust me, it's in there. If you are doubting that, do a word study on perseverance in the scripture, and you will find it is those who persevere to the end whom are saved. But nevertheless, we are called to do work unto the Lord. Romans 8, 5 through 8, For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. That is to set our minds on the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. All right, so if we look at this in its more practical sense, what does this mean? Well, what does it mean in our modern, modern media-saturated world to set your mind on the flesh versus setting your mind on the spirit? A lot of this has to do with the decisions about what media entertainment we are consuming. If we are consuming things that is sexual or violent, is it any wonder that even as those who profess to know Christ live out our lives in violence and lust? That is exactly what happens. Okay, but for those of us who have cast aside the old thing saying, yes, I do like that movie, but it's not worth having it to entertain myself into the fleshly life. And we instead watch something more pure and we start putting on this the, uh, the mind of Christ. This is exactly what this is talking about. All right. So uh, it, it does take the work. Now, when uh, only the remnant remain, it is because God gave them the power to obey. In I can't remember if it was the last message or, or the first message on this chapter or maybe chapter four. I said there was something I read that I had wrong in my initial notes. And then literally, as I was discussing it with some people, God sends me to this next part in Romans. I'm about to read that very night in my reading. It was like the sovereignty of God had thus decreed the very chapter that I was already scheduled to read was the thing that countered that viewpoint. And that viewpoint is, is that 
Those people, the remnant, those 7,000 that have not bowed their knee to Baal that God tells Elijah about, they were preserved not because of their work, but because of God's work. This is the verse God sent to me, Romans 11, 2 through 6. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? Lord, they've killed your prophets, yet they have torn down your altars, and I alone am left. And they are seeking my life. But what is the divine response to him? That is to Elijah. God says, I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. In the same way, there also has come to be, at the present time, a remnant according to God's gracious choice. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. Two things to mention about this. The first thing is that, as I said in my daily walk, was it this week or last week? I think it was last week's daily walk. Only a few are saved. Only a few are saved. At this present time, a remnant according to God's gracious choice. This is not everybody who meanders on into a church on Sunday and warms a pew. These are the people God has called whom seek the Lord in all ways. That is the first principle. The second principle is it says down here in the, the last verse, verse 6 here, if it is by grace, it is not on the basis of works. It is by grace that God has given us the power to overcome and become among that remnant. Now, we move on. Uh, this is after the seeking of righteousness. The people, of course, are going to refuse to seek. Amos chapter 5, verses 16 and 17. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of hosts, the Lord. There was wailing in all the plazas and in all the streets. They say, alas, alas. They also call to the farmer, call the farmer to mourning and the professional mourners to lamentations. And in all the vineyards, there was wailing because I will pass through in the midst of you, says the Lord. After the people refuse to seek God, he shows a vision of the people wailing in the street. Okay, this is uh, Amos 8, 3. We will get to this soon. The songs of the palace will turn to wailing in that day, declares the Lord. Many will be the corpses in every place. They will cast them forth in silence. That is to be seen. The wail, uh, they wail in the various streets. They're out there. The whole streets are wailing. And um, they wail in the farmlands. Um, this actually happened in Joel. Uh, Be ashamed, O farmers. Wail, O vine dresses, for the wheat and the barley because of the harvest of the field is destroyed. So they will bring in professional mourners. Now, professional mourners were often hired for funerals. They bring them in, so there's a whole abundance of crying and whining. Nowadays, we don't bring in professional mourners. We just bring in AI robotic priests. Yes, it actually happens. Kind of nuts. But uh, hey, welcome to uh, welcome to this century where we uh, we set up a bunch of false gods and then we set up robots to worship those false gods with the rituals recreated. Yes, that actually happens. I have an article about it in the stream. Stream.org. Stream.org. Have a look at my name. Murosky, M-U-R-O-S-K-Y. You can look up. I have two articles written over there. One of those is on AI gods. Uh, very fun stuff. All right. Uh, so uh, all areas of the land are impacted by this. Now, in Amos chapter 5, verses 18 through 20, Alas, you who are longing for the day of the Lord, for what purpose will the day of the Lord be to you? It will be darkness and not of light. As when a man flees from a lion and a bear meets him, or he goes home, leans his hand against the wall, and a snake bites him, will not the day of the Lord be darkness instead of light, even gloom with no brightness in it? Think of the connotations. I am seeking all of these things. I'm seeking the light of God, but it's really darkness. I'm seeking the safety of my, of my home, uh, but I get killed by a snake. I'm fleeing from a lion, but I meet a bear. Okay, I, I heard uh, John Maxwell once give a, a sermon. It was a, a funny little joke he said in a sermon. You know, early on, somebody he was talking about the various mistakes he's made. He's like, uh, 
you know, Lord, can you just come now? He says, I might, but you may not be coming with me. You know, the day of the Lord was not light. <laughs> okay. And that's what we're seeing. The wicked are seeking the end. This is like in the end times, right? Remember this, there is coming to come a time when God is pouring out wrath so deep the unbelievers are seeking death and they won't find it. Okay, like like the people will become immortal here in their insanity. And in those days, many men will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die and death flees from them. Come back, Grim Reaper, come back. So it says Revelation 9, 6. All right, they're seeking it. They just cannot find it. All right, they want the end but they think they will go to heaven, but they are deceived. There are many, many deceived. Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me you who practice lawlessness All right there are many people who are stinking they're longing for the light of heaven and when it finally comes they will not be there this is a frightening frightening thing all right so um, in light of this um, they think they're going to heaven because of their false worship Matthew 23, 13, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from people. For you do not allow, you do not enter in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. These Pharisees were doing so much false witness, they excluded people who did not do their man-made laws that were not part of the law of God, kicking them out of the synagogues because they did not follow the traditions of men, even though they did follow the ways of God. So you can see that this is going to be a terrifying time. Many, many deceived people are going to come out. The day of the Lord for the unconverted is destruction. Joel 2, 2, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. As the dawn is spread over the mountains, so there is a great and mighty people. There has never been anything like it, nor will there be again after it to the years of many generations. All right. So uh, again, the, the, the day of the Lord is a horrible day, a day of destruction for the unconverted. The problem we have is there are, as this chapter elucidates and many other scriptures do as well, many people who believe that they are going to be in heaven. They believe they are saved and they are not. So God tarrying is a blessing to those people as perhaps yet they might repent. Last verses here in Amos, chapter 5, verses 21 through 27. I hate, I reject your festivals, nor do I delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer up to me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them. I will not even look at the peace offerings of your fatlings. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not even listen to the sound of your harps, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. Did you present me with sacrifices and grain offerings in the wilderness for 40 years? O house of Israel, you also carried along Sikuath, your king and Kayun, your images, the star of your gods, which you made for yourselves. Therefore, I will make you go into exile beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is the Lord of hosts. True worship is not in the ritual. It is not in the sacrifices. Okay, I reject your festivals, he says. No, nor do I delight in your solemn assemblies. This is what he writes. Okay, in our modern day, true worship is not attending church. It is not serving in the soup kitchen or any other type of religious activity. Then and now, what true worship is summed up Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 5 through 9. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. 
These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your hearts. You shall teach them diligently to your sons. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontals on your foreheads. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The overarching principle, the number one thing is the adherence to the word. I could also throw in here, it's not in my notes, but James chapter 1, verse 27. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God our Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. An element of service and an element of purity. Once again, that righteousness is back. It is not just to serve in a soup kitchen. It is not just to show up to church. It is to actually live a righteous life whereby we are living by the commands of God because we know what the word of God says. And it starts here in Deuteronomy chapter 6 with the word and teaching the commandments. Okay, Saul thought that he was doing the righteous things because of rituals and sacrifices. This is 1 Samuel 15, 17 through 23. I'm going to summarize this rather than read it all because we're already almost at 30 minutes. So this is when God tells him, go and completely destroy the Amalekites. Or uh, yeah, the Amalekites. Completely kill them. Totally destroy the Amalekites. Save nothing. Save no livestock. Save no people. Rip open the pregnant women. Kill the little children in the streets. All of them. Destroy them for they were great sinners. He brings back all these livestock. He brings back the king of Amalek, Agag, which, by the way, Haman, the wicked Haman from the book of Esther, was an Agagite. If Saul had followed through the principle, the book of Esther may not have happened because the descendants of Agag would have been destroyed, but they weren't. So he brings them back and Samuel's like, hey, um, what's going on? Didn't you tell you? He says, oh, I, I did God's word. He says, what is this bleeding in my ears? Well, we brought back the best of it to sacrifice to God. And Samuel comes back. He says down here near the bottom, bottom, uh, bottom quarter of the screen there. Samuel says, Has the Lord much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. Rebellion is the sin of divination and insubordination is as in the iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you from being king. Samuel thought it was all about the rituals and it wasn't. It was about the obedience. This is why Warming the church pew on Sunday is not what gets you into heaven. What gets you into heaven is placing your trust in Christ and being sealed by him and then seeking out to do the works of righteousness, as the scripture says. Now, to contrast this, David did know what God wanted. Psalm 51, verses 16 and 17. For you do not delight in sacrifices, otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Modern vernacular, God wants humility. It is the humility to recognize you are incapable of coming to him that you accept the sacrifice of Christ. That is what God wants. David understood it. In this section, the people thought they were right. The section of Amos. The people thought they were right because they did all of the things prescribed in the law. They did these rituals, all these things. And we must consider this as we seek God in our traditions, yet not in our souls. And we had mentioned earlier on, um, I believe it was in the, was it in the first message of this one? No, it was in, uh, it was in Amos chapter four. We worship in ignorance of traditions. We do not worship uh, by and large in America. Most American churches I have attended, and I've attended a lot of them since I travel the country full time. Most churches are doing church out of tradition and most people there are in total ignorance. Okay, they are worshiping ignorantly out of tradition, not seeking 
the true God. We must consider this as we look to our specific traditions. And look at what Isaiah says, Isaiah 29, 13, and 14. The Lord said, Because this people draw near with their words and honor me with their lip service, but they remove their hearts from me, and their reverence for me consists of tradition learned by rote. Therefore, behold, I will once again deal marvelously with this people, wondrously, marvelously, and the wisdom of their wise men will perish, and the discernment of their discerning men will be concealed. Of course, that part is uh, part, of, part of that is also quoted in Romans. Paul is quoting directly from Isaiah in that portion. Um, or I'm sorry, I think it's actually Jesus mentioning it to the Pharisees. I didn't write that in my notes. But people have added to their worship the God, um, of God, the worship also of many false gods. They basically worshiped whoever and whatever and however they wanted. They're like, the more the merrier, let's bring in more gods to worship them all. So God wants our loyal and dedicated worship, soul worship, only him. Okay, He gives us many, many trials to seek him, to seek him right. But he casts us off if we fail to seek him fully. Those are the warnings that we have about, uh, about the word. So this is why it's very important for us to stop and look and consider the things of God and what he would have us to do. Pray today to see, are you really doing church out of rote tradition and ignorantly? Or do you actually know the word of God and it is so boiling inside of your heart that you really need to seek him? As the deer pants, so my soul longs for you, O God, is how the psalmist begins Psalm 42. Okay, that is so powerful. That is that true mark of the Christian that you love the word of God and you just cannot get enough of it. That is what you should pray for. And if you do not know a lot about the Word of God, spend some time over the next few years to figure it out. It is the one, the objective thing that points us to truth. Your church is not the objective thing that points you to truth, as good as it may be, and as good as your pastor may be, as good as a sermon may be. It is the Word of God that points you to truth. Okay, somebody on the internet, somebody on the radio is not the final arbiter of truth. God's word is the only objective thing we have. And that supersedes the spiritual feelings. It supersedes the churches and the denominationalism. It supersedes everything else. The word of God. Take the time to learn it. With that, seek also his righteousness. Thank you for watching, and I hope that you enjoy your daily walk in our Lord.